Hey, good evening. We're going to talk about species strategies, basically how to survive and different ways to do it population-wise here. Okay, I'll adjust my camera. There we go. <laughs> All righty. Y'all ready to rock and roll tonight? All right, lady, let's do it then, shall we? Let's do it. First off, of course, I always want to say thank you for coming tonight. And if you can, please follow us on all of our lovely little social medias. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Think Fiveable. Okay. We have lots of stuff going on almost every single night. In fact, I believe uh, we'll be posting another. Uh, Ape session later this weekend, I believe. I'll look it up before we leave here tonight. All right, so here's the things that we're going to be covering tonight. Okay, I want to talk about uh, the difference between a generalist and a specialist when we discuss the uh, species. Uh, the difference between K and R selected species, and actually where we got those names from instead of just randomly choosing letters. And then last but not least, I want to discuss survivorship curves. Okay. So let's kick it into high gear here, and we'll just start off with the generalist versus specialist. Uh, now, these streams always go a lot better when we have a little bit of classroom participation. So I have a question for you. You're sick with the flu. It's about to get to be flu season right now. Hopefully you're getting your flu shots when needed. Uh, what type of doctor would you go see? Would you go see a heart surgeon or would you go see a family doctor? All right. Got a couple of responses for bees. Now, here's the follow-up question. Why would you see the family doctor and not the heart surgeon? If you can just give me a little tippy-tap on your keyboard, why would you go see your family doctor and not a heart surgeon when you have the flu? I know, it seems like a silly question, right? Thank you, Libby. Thank you, Dakota. Oh, yeah, if you're, if you're going by money-wise, it's definitely way cheaper to go to your family doctor than it is the heart surgeon. I happen to have a friend of mine who's a heart surgeon. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's not cheap, okay? And of course, you know, heart surgeons don't deal with the flu. We want to go to somebody that it, it, they don't have to be a specialist. They're going to be able to take care of the, I don't want to say mundane, but the more general uh, types of ailments that we have. Okay. So we'll start off tonight talking about what a generalist species happens to be. Okay. Maybe you recognize some of our uh, animals over here. The, the top one is the trash panda and the other one is the coyote. Uh, of course, it's not really a trash panda, but uh, that's what they call them in you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, which is one of my favorite movies. I love Marvel movies. All right, so little notes tonight here. Hopefully, you remember a few things from freshman year. Yeah, thank you for the smiley faces on that one. All right, so what we think of as a general species, if you were to put it into layman's terms or basically human terms, uh, I've always considered them a jack of all trades, all right? Jack of all trades and master of none. They're like the handyman or the general contractor. And our example tonight, it was our uh, family doctor, what's known as a general practitioner. And I'm sorry if there's extra sounds on my computer tonight. Uh, and I, I put on their second grade teachers. You, hopefully you remember your second grade. I, I barely do. I remember finger painting a lot. But you had that one teacher all day long, for the most part, and they taught you all the subjects. So they had to know a little bit about everything, just like your general contractor and your family doctor. They had to know a little bit about everything. They're not going to be uh, super specialized or have overly large amounts of knowledge in one particular area. We're looking at a lot of knowledge in little areas. All right. So. Where would you find these? We're thinking that this is a very broad niche type of species. Uh, 
they again they're they're not very specialized they can do a lot of different things if you look at the the coyote they can go a lot of different places they're going to eat a lot of different foods uh they're just again they're just like one step above the dog as it is right now they're just all over the place the same thing with our raccoons we can see them doing lots of different things they're, you can't just peg them down as to like you know what's the job of of a raccoon or a, you know, a coyote you know, they have lots of different roles you can say in the environment now when it comes to food again nobody is ever going to consider our lovely little beautiful raccoon a very picky eater neither are the coyotes they're going to be able to get as much food as they possibly can at any point in time okay so again lots of food whenever they can oh i got a couple of questions here all right there all right cool all right then. All right, so questions we're answering our previous one over there. Okay, so location again, they're very widespread. If I was to show you the the map of where you'd find these, uh, both of these creatures, you're going to see them all over the place. Now, the photo of the raccoon was actually taken in Germany, so you're going to find our uh, our specific raccoon. You're going to find them throughout most of North America into the southern portions of Canada, uh, most of the United States, and upper parts of Mexico, and Part, parts of uh, Central America, and when you bring over to Europe, you're going to see them a couple little patches here and there, and apparently there's a huge chunk of them in Germany. Uh, again, that's where this picture was taken. Uh, very similar to the coyote, it's going to be very widespread. It's lots of different habitats and locations are open and available to the coyote. So our next part is going to be talking about tolerance. Okay. Have you guys discussed uh, tolerance versus resilience, uh, basically resilience versus resistance, those forms of tolerance yet? No? Okay. Uh, just a really quick, basically, resistance is just that. How often or you know, when there is any changes, are you able to resist or are you able to not change as much? And then resilience is how quickly you can come back from that change. So with... Our general species, they're quite tolerant to changes. Uh, they're able to resist it. They're not uh, really worried about too terribly much change unless it's a very dramatic change. Uh, and they are quite resilient. They can come back from uh, from quite a few things. I know the coyote himself. Uh, I did a couple of papers on the coyotes and uh, the red wolves when I was in college. And they are starting to actually interbreed with other organisms. And that's how, one of their ways that they're uh, showing their tolerance of different environmental conditions. Okay. So again, our, our raccoons are invading urban areas. And as I just said that the coyotes are hybridizing with wolves, uh, well, they are hybridizing with wolves, but they're also hybridizing with our dogs. Uh, this is how they're able to maintain some of the uh, changes in their ecosystems, be it man-made or just a natural change. They're able to do this right here. Now, some of the examples of our general species, as I said, are the, the raccoons and the coyotes. White-tailed deer are also one. Uh, most of the species are rats. When I looked at the, the difference between the uh, the black rat and the, the brown rat, the brown rat was literally overlooked in the entire planet and even portions of Antarctica where we have human settlements. And then, of course, a cockroach. You can't really figure out what the job of a cockroach is other than to just scare people and annoy them and the horseshoe crab i i hadn't even thought about this but you know the horseshoe crab is also a generalist that uh you can find them in many locations throughout the world and uh eating lots of different varieties of food too okay so really quickly before i go on to specialists do you have another generalist species that uh you can think of real quickly that you can add to our list here that i hadn't thought of yet Oh, yeah, the mockingbird is a good one, too, definitely. I was thinking of a bird species uh, when I was here. Yeah, most of the rats are, and, and mice, too. I got to go down to Belize uh, a couple years ago, and we we have grackles around here. They're just, I, I'd love to make the noise for you, but it would cause most of you all to leave the stream right now. 
It's a very distinctive noise. Uh, but I found the exact same grackles down in Belize, and they're not a migratory bird from what I can remember. And I was just totally surprised at how far reaching these things were. It was just, it really blew my mind. And then I was very upset because, of course, you know, I had to listen to the grackles way down in Belize again. Uh, yeah, actually, Fred, you're right. It's, uh, seagulls, by the way, a little heads up, Fred is one of my, uh, one of my buddies. We're uh, readers for the AP exam. I'll do a little shout out to my boy. Uh, yeah, seagulls are another uh, good uh, variety of uh, generalists. And uh, I'm here in North Texas, and we actually have a grouping of seagulls that fly all the way from the Gulf Coast to North Texas. They make the 500, 600 uh, mile journey every winter, and they stay here, which is just insane. Oh yeah, pigeons are another good one. Thank you, Dakota. Uh, I called my I called them uh, my my professor in college called them the uh, flying rat, uh, carriers of disease. All right, excellent. Let's uh, let's go on to our next one. Yeah, a lot of the uh, a lot of our urban species are generalists, and it's because of uh, thank you, Katie. It, it is because of that broad niche that they uh, they're not really picky of where they where they need to live or what they need to eat. There's a wide variety for them. Now, what we're going to see in our specialists is very much the opposite of that. Very opposite. To, again, to, to put this into layman's terms, these are your master craftsmen. This is like the electrician, the brain surgeon, or the heart surgeon from earlier. And uh, a physics teacher. You don't, uh, you don't see a lot of physics teachers doing a lot of other things in life that's they're pretty much, that's what they do. They may teach math, but again, all physics really is, is math with bowling balls. You know, drop a bowling ball out of a window, because apparently that's something that happens commonplace in physics classrooms. Uh, looking at the images I have right here, of course, we have the real panda, and he's not really eating trash. And I love this, this beautiful little bird right here. Such a beautiful little thing. Uh, it's known as the sword-billed hummingbird, and it's a form of uh, co-evolution with this flower. Okay, so let's let's get a little of the notes here. This is going to be a very narrow niche. They're going to have very, very limited diet. Again, that panda right there is basically almost entirely going to eat uh, bamboo, and this uh, sword-billed hummingbird is only going to eat something. Uh, with that long flower right here, the, the long flower petal parts to get his beak in there. In fact, his his little uh, beak right there is actually longer than his entire body. So you can imagine there's not a lot of food that you can actually eat. Uh, I know if my mouth was way out to here, I'd be a lot skinnier than I am right now. All right, so where are we going to find these? Again, just like their food, it's very limited. So therefore, you're only going to find them in very specific places around the planet. Now, there may be lots of little places here and there, but it's the where they live, the, the specific habitat in, uh, in the ecosystems and all that is going to be very, very limited. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. I'm sorry, I lost my, uh, I lost my second screen so I can advance my slides here. Uh, tolerance, they're highly sensitive. They're insanely sensitive. I know... Uh, pandas, we uh, we have all of our pandas. Uh, we actually, I don't want to say rent, but we borrow them from China. And uh, we know that uh, when we try to mate them in the wild, it's uh, it's re relatively easy. But when we try to do it in captivity, uh, it's almost insanely di so difficult. And it's because they have very, very low tolerance. They're highly sensitive to change. So any little thing is going to cause them to, uh, their populations to plummet. So when we look at different forms of uh, climate change or ecosystem change or damage, uh, when we start looking at specialist species, we're going to actually get the evidence really quick because of their high sensitivity. Okay. And again, here's my lovely little examples of you know, the panda and the sword build uh, hummingbird and eat the koala. All it eats is eucalyptus, which is rather toxic to most organisms. And yet the koala is perfectly happy eating it. And that's all it eats. And then the Venus flytrap, it's another specialist. If you think, you know, you know, I can just do photosynthesis all day long, but no, I want to eat flies. 
That's that, that that's my go-to meal right there. You don't have a lot of plants that are going to do that. There's very few species that are carnivorous like that. All right, so like I did last time, I need you guys to please give me a couple of examples of your favorite specialist species that you can come up off uh, from what you've talked about. Bald eagle, yeah, they're uh, relatively uh, small areas, uh, and, actually, and they're actually scavengers. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Ben Franklin didn't want it to be the national bird. He, want, he actually wanted the turkey. Uh, oh, the scrub jay, thank you. Oh, thank you, Katie. Katie is saying that the, the scrub jay down there in Florida, very colonial, it's uh, endemic and all that. We're going to find very, very selected areas. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see, the, the kangaroo rat, there's specific species of kangaroo rat that you can only find in certain locations. And uh, yes, of course, many of the marsupial species, we think of them basically just staying in uh, Australia and uh, the surrounding islands, uh, Polynesia around there and all that. Even though that's a large chunk of the planet, we think of it, you know, percentage-wise, uh, they're very, very well contained right there. We do have a couple of species of marsupials in South America, and I know the opossum comes up into my house every so often. I live next to a river. Yeah, Florida manatees, uh, because of their dietary restrictions, yes, you're going to see them to be kind of a specialist, although they can travel lots of areas. So when we think of generalists and specialists, there are a lot of creatures that are going to flow on the continuum, you know, with the, the edges being, you know, specialist and journalist, we are going to see some that kind of bleed back and forth. We're going to actually talk about a few of those things tonight too, because some of the things we're going to discuss, uh, you just can't like pigeonhole them. You have to realize that again, it's a continuum of items, a continuation from one, um, person to that. I'm, I'm just blabbing. I'm sorry. I need to get, you know, it's time to take a drink of my Mountain Dew. No, uh, no styrofoam cups tonight. I have my reusable steel. I went to a training this summer. And of course I have my reusable straw. No uh, environmental degradation tonight. Unlike last time. It really is tough to talk on camera. Last time I did this, I uh, just felt like I'd talk for 50 minutes and I couldn't talk for the rest of the rest of the night, which my wife was kind of happy about. I'd just leave her alone for a while. Alrighty, so uh, I like to put things in the visual terms, okay? So looking at these little dartboard methods, uh, I'm a very visual person, I think, in pictures and all that. I... Uh, so I, I looked at this. I saw this online. It's not my favorite example, but it's the one I could recreate. So when we think of generalists and specialists, uh, we, we tend to think of generalists are like all around the place, right? All over. Okay, you don't uh, you don't see them doing only one thing. They're doing lots of different things. So on on this dartboard, you're going to see that it's again it's scattered. You know, they're they're all over the place. Okay. Again, kind of like when I was talking about five minutes ago. Now, as a specialist, they are very narrowed and centered on that one thing or that uh, that one place. Okay, so again, think of it this way. My uh, my favorite image when I was uh, googling it was uh, there was two heads, and one had a whole bunch of gears winding around, lots of different sizes, and that was the specialist. The, I mean, that was the that was the generalist. The specialist only had like two or three gears that, excuse me, worked together to make the the system. Who, excuse me again, uh, to make the system work. So that's another visual thing. Uh, if you're a fan of charts, boom, have I got you all hooked up right here? Another way to talk about it. So, how did I basically? What, what was the the layman's terms for generalist and specialist? Let's see if you guys were paying attention. If I was to put them into human terms, how would I describe a general store specialist? Yes, thank you, Dakota, the jack of all trades. Which one is that? General store specialist. I like it when they're doing FRQs 
you know, if they ask two questions, you have to specify which one you're answering first. Yeah. So the the journalist is the jack of all trades, and the specialist is more of the, the master electrician or you know a physics teacher. Uh, as an apes teacher, because we cover so many different topics, we would ourselves would actually be more of a generalist. Uh, again, we're teaching literally like eight different topics, eight different classes, all in one year. It's it's insane. All right, so the niche or a niche, if you want to pronounce it, or if you want to be like my freshman niches. Uh, the, the journalist is very broad, over you know, overly large, and the specialist is quite narrow. Again, it's kind of like the, uh, the, the dartboard method we looked at. All right, what can you guys tell me about their diet? As I stroke my beard all wise-like. I'm hoping to get down to wizard level. That's going to be like another three or four inches. Right now, I think I'm at the sea captain. So their diet, what do you remember about their diet? Yeah, journalists are not picky. They're going to eat basically everything, just like the trash pandas. So the way, I, again, I like to tell silly jokes and just, again, nothing but dad jokes in my classroom. Uh, so when I think of the diet of the journalists and specialists, Boom, I think of generals are basically, you're at a buffet. Yeah, and thank you, look at the, the, the specialist. It's very less variety. So I think of like fine dining. When you go to a very fine restaurant, they don't have a menu that has like 14 different burgers. All right? You get very few selections. And that's what I think of a specialist. Uh, generalist, you're, you're just going to the, you know, the pig trough and, you know, have at it. Uh, but the specialist, they're... More refined. There's very few things that they can eat or will eat. Location, I think of the journalist as that world traveler. They're all over the place. All right. And then the specialist, maybe you can get the reference. Uh, they can only be in very few places. So, you know, you're in my spot. You need to move. You're in my spot. Bonus points if you can name the person or the character that normally would say this to poor Penny. Uh, yeah, Sheldon Cooper. My wife constantly is calling me Sheldon Cooper. I just, I think of myself more of a, a very tall Leonard, actually. Tolerance, that generalist is just going to go with the flow. Falcon and Bucky, yeah, yeah, I can see Falcon and Bucky doing that, too. Yeah. Again, Marvel movies are awesome. Uh, so, generalists, we're going to just go with the flow. I think of, like, you know, that hippie's like, yeah, dude, yeah, peace. Whereas the specialist... You know, that's not how we do it. This is as very specific. You have to do just like this, this, this. You have to be, you know, right on it. Hashtag slip up. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, I, I, I saw that. All right, so here we go. Again, our examples were, again, some of the easy ones. Just if you need to keep it just to, to keep in your mind, again, it's going to be that raccoon and our panda, Okay. Before I go on to our next topic, do you have any questions I can answer about a generalist versus a specialist species tonight? Anything at all? Type it in the, the comment section or the, the question and answer qu area. And I'm perfectly fine. I'll try to answer whatever I can tonight. But if not, then we'll go on to our next part. So. Totally understood. Well, excellent. Thank you, Katie. All right, let's go on, shall we? I do have one question I need for y'all to answer real quickly, and it's this. How would you classify humans? Would you classify them as a journalist or a specialist? Now, again, my students were talking about this. They were coming up with examples of both, but you have to look at the actual species, not individual populations. How would you classify the humans? Yeah, generalist trash, well, that's possible right there. And what about blue whales? How would you define the blue whale, generalist or specialist? Definitely specialist. If you remember from a famous uh, big-eared mouse movie, two little fish were swimming around, and they got gobbled up as a big blue whale was eating krill. Uh, the blue whales, that's all they eat. Even though they can be found in lots of different sections of the ocean, they only specifically eat krill. 
Swoon away, exactly. Now, last but not least, what about bees? How would you define the bees? I was actually kind of surprised on this one when I looked it up. Yeah, you're right. It is very tough because it, it does depend on the species, all right? Uh, if you look at the normal honeybee, the normal honeybee is a total generalist. Uh, not really super picky about the flowers that it eats from, but there are very uh, specific bees. There are uh, species of bees that they will only uh, drink the nectar from specific flowers or live in very specific uh, plants or trees or locations. So when you're looking at bees, you're going to have to look at the individual species in order to to understand them. All right. Excellent, y'all. I'm glad you were playing along. Let's move on to our next topic tonight. The K and the R selected species. Uh, right now, I'm going to hopefully not melt your brain a little bit with this big, ugly equation. You know what the good thing is? You don't have to worry about the big, ugly equation. All right. I'm not really a big math guy. Uh, but I did want to put the, this equation out there. That way I can explain to you where we got the, the letters K and R from. Uh, this actually was a an equation that actually the the K and R selected species came up from uh, the uh, I'm sorry yeah, I'm just blabbering again. Uh, it was coined by two gentlemen, uh, Robert MacArthur and E.O. Wilson. I happen to love E.O. Wilson; he's one of my absolute favorites. He actually gets to come to our uh, to our campus, our our college campus, and did a whole hour and a half lecture. Oh, I was just I, I just fanboyed all over the place. It was great. Uh, so they came up with it back in the 1967, and they were trying to determine, like, uh, basically how old you can get. Okay, so when they came up with the, the this equation, or they helped with this part, if you'll look, uh, dn over dt, so this is basically the, the rate of change in your population. So n is your population, t of, is, is time, just like in a normal physics class. R is going to be your growth rate. So the growth rate of our, uh, I, I keep moving the mouse on my screen thinking y'all can see. It. I know you can't. I'm sorry. Uh, the N here is going to be the, again, the, the RN is the, the growth rate of your population. And then K over there is talking about uh, carrying capacity. So if you think of just the word growth rate and carrying capacity, this will definitely be able to help you out. I know our next stream, I won't be doing it when none of my friends are going to be doing it. I believe it's later this week, and like I said, I'll, I'll look up to see when it's happening. Uh, we're going to be talking. They're going to be talking about growth rate and carrying capacity of an ecosystem. All right, so that's where this uh, K and R comes from. Okay, so let me hit you with a couple more pictures. Yes, that is me. The the the. Well, I'd say the big one, but the top picture, the big guy's me, and the bottom picture, I'm the little guy. All right, that's my son in both pictures. And yes, I did have permission. I specifically asked him if I could show this and use this for a national public. And he was totally super happy with it. He says, it's not a problem. I don't know any of these people. Anyway, so let's talk about your K and R species. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not a small person. So when I talk about generally large, I mean, like, as a species, you're going to be generally larger. Okay. So think about that when we're... we're come up with the examples here in a minute. The parents spend a great deal amount of time and resources in child rearing. And we actually, we call this, uh, I'm trying to make sure I can pronounce it properly, attritial. Okay, so the way we think of attritial, attritial species, uh, again, tend to not be able to take care of themselves at birth. You can see this tiny little child in the top picture. He was literally just a couple weeks old. He could not take care of himself at all. I kept trying to get him to run with me or kick a ball, and he would just lay there. Just, just kind of boring. So, uh, you know, we had to take care of him. And now, this picture at the bottom, that was actually taken at the first day of school, my son's senior year, this year. And so, you can definitely tell that uh, we've, uh, we, we've taken care of him. We've definitely uh, spent a lot of great deal of time and money and food and resources on this child. So that he can have a better chance of survival itself. No, we are not playing kick the baby, Fred. 
I may be Canadian, but we're not playing that game. Anyway, uh, so let's talk about uh, they're going to have very few offspring per reproductive event. Okay, that's very important that you put that in there uh, because we don't want you to think that they're only going to have a couple of kids total. But every reproductive event, every time that uh, uh, gestation happens, they're going to have just a small amount, anywhere between one and four most times, uh, with one being the the, the main uh, average right there. And again, relatively long lifespans. Uh, humans, we're, we're going longer than ever now. We, uh, I believe there was somebody who was celebrating their 113th birthday that would, could be officially uh, recorded. So that was that's insane. Again, your case species, because of all that time and energy put into uh, rearing of the children and taking care of them, they're going to have a very long lifespan compared to most other creatures. And again, uh, with that long lifespan also comes the idea that it takes a long time to reach sexual maturity. Now, with humans, you can do it. You can basically reach sexual maturity within your early teens. Uh, but with other organisms, you know, it's going to be a couple of years before uh, maturity can actually happen for them. And that's when you... Uh, most times we consider it to be uh, the sign of, you know, you know adult who is when you reach that. Okay. Now, case species truly do prefer very stable environments. They are not super happy when it comes to uh, change as a, as a species. However, they're highly competitive for the resources. Okay. And it's because it's a very crowded niche. There's lots of different... Uh, organisms in that same area, so they're going to be very good at competition for further needs. And if you look back at uh, human history of all the different, uh, basically hominid species, you can see that uh, we've come about because of our ability to outcompete other organisms, like the Cro-Magnons and uh, Neanderthals, which that is how you pronounce that word, Neanderthal. So. All right, let's keep going here a little bit. Here are our beautiful, lovely examples. Again, we have our humans, eagles, elephants, and I hadn't thought about it, but it was pretty neat. Parrots. Parrots are an actually K-selected species too. Okay? So just like with our generalists and our specialists, I need you to come up with a couple more examples of what you think is a K-selected species. All right? So if you'll put that into our... Uh, Oh, comment section off the side there while I get another drink of my Mountain Dew. This is not an endorsement for any sort of like that. It's just my wife's out of town, and she doesn't like the smell of it, so I'm allowed to drink it right now. It's great. All right, so can you come up with any K-selected species that are not listed on here? Rhinos, yeah. Definitely, they're very large creatures. You can see... Uh, they have a relatively long lifespan. Uh, unfortunately, as a species, there's very few of them left now. So, uh, Castro, I believe it's uh, turtles. I'm glad you brought up the turtles because uh, we're going to be talking about that here in just a, a little bit after we talk about the R selected species. Uh, remember earlier when we said that uh, things are going to be on a continuum, we can't really like just pigeonhole. Turtles is one of those that we can't really just pigeonhole. Uh, gators, I can, I can see that we're going to put them, I think we're going to put those on, so on that continuum. So let me, uh, let me go on to the, uh, uh the R selected species. Now hippos, yeah, definitely, thank you. Uh, yeah, depo, de definitely the hippos are going to be uh, on our K selected species. Excellent. Uh, I was trying to figure out some different types of plants, but, uh, after we talk about S and the continuum, then you'll find out that. There's not a lot of these K-selected species for plants, with the exception of the Methuselah tree, which creates one seed every century, which is just absolutely mind-blowing right there. Uh, there is a Methuselah tree. I believe it's a few thousand years old. It's uh, actually in the United States. And it's actually kind of a secreted location so that people can't uh, get to it. They'll tell you what state it is if you want to Google it, but uh, the actual physical location, like GPS look, look, uh, look uh, coordinates, are uh, kind of like under lock and key. But again, it just makes one seed every 
thousand years. Yeah, just like the the corpse flower, uh, we can think of them also as a case selected species. I know it's not the largest plant in the world, but you know, a a hundred pound flower that's that's no uh, that's no small thing right there. I do like talking about the corpse flowers in my class that the students will uh, Google it and they're just totally amazed. It's one of the more odd uh, organisms on this planet. All right, so let's look at our, oh yeah, it's the reason why it's called the corpse flower, of course, is it smells like dead rotting meat. All right, so let's talk about our, our selected species. This happens to be a lovely little picture that I took with my camera. My cell phone camera. This is my grass. Obviously, uh, I haven't mowed in a while. But let's talk about grasses and our selected species. <clears throat> Generally, we're thinking of our selected species as a uh, a smaller species, not a smaller number, but smaller again in size. Just like the K's are very large in size, these are guys are going to be the exact polar opposite. Okay, so everything that the K was. The R is going to be the opposite of that. They do not invest hardly any time in their children. All right, We're, the children are actually going to be known as being very precocious or being able to take care of themselves almost immediately from birth, if not exactly from birth, then in a very short amount of time afterwards, like you know, less than you know a year afterwards, they can take care of themselves. In most cases, less than a week or two. And wow. Okay, so when I copied this, I made a mistake. That's supposed to say very many offspring per reproductive event. So I will fix that before we uh, we post this online. Uh, very many offspring. So please ignore my typos there. These guys are insane when they have their kids. They are just all over the place. Yes, dandelions are an example, a great example of that. Uh, remember to... When you have your dandelion, here's, here, here's my, my glue bottle right here. When you have the dandelion, turn your head and then turn it below. And don't just suck all the dandelion feathers in, you know, my gorilla glue here. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, be very careful of that. Uh, R is for rifle spring. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> yes, I, yeah. All right. Let's keep going on that one. So they're going to have a very short lifespan compared to most other organisms, which kind of makes sense. You know, if you have lots of kids, uh, and then they're going to be able to reach uh, sexual maturity very quickly. Yeah, like most of your fish, insane amounts of kids, they're going to be able to reproduce very quickly. They're going to reach, reach sexual maturity probably within a year or so. Uh, then they're, at, they're going to be able to have lots of kids. So usually the longer the lifespan the fewer the amount of offspring, and then the shorter the lifespan, the larger amount of offspring. It's kind of that, uh, that, that polar dynamic right there. Now, are pigs and our species? Uh, again, it's kind of that continuum thing. They're going to lean closer to the K side than they would the R side. Uh, for a couple of other characteristics we'll talk about here in a little bit. Yes, they're going to have relatively large amounts of uh, children compared to like us or some of the R, other R species. But again, because of other characteristics of K's and R's, they're going to see that the, the pigs are going to slide closer to that K side than they would the R. Thanks for that uh, question there, Dakota. Uh, as an R species, there's relatively low competition for resources. It's not that you're specialized or anything like that. It's just... Uh, you don't really, you're, again, you're not really picky. Think of grass. It eats the sun. There's always going to be the sun. It's not like it's going to have to really fight for it. And if it does, uh, then grass can go grow elsewhere you know, if it's being blocked by trees or whatever. So, again, because of that relatively quick lifespan, relatively quick uh, sexual maturity and numerous offspring, unlike what the screen says, numerous offspring, uh, they're able to just basically pick up and move as a species. Examples are going to be our insects, all insects from what I can, from what I was able to uh, remember and look up again, all the insects are actually known as a K species, uh, an R species. Most of your mice are going to be doing the same thing here. Uh, bacteria. Oh my gosh. I hadn't even thought about it. So I'm glad, I'm glad I'm doing this before I do it with my, my freshman students. 
uh, yeah, bacteria are totally an R species. You don't think of them as being large. That would just, you know, freak everybody out. And then, of course, most of your grasses. And then the other examples you gave us tonight. So thank you, that. Thank you for that part there. All right, what well, can I answer for you guys real quickly? I, I, I have a couple, a little bit, a few more things I want to talk about with the K&R species. But do uh, you have any questions I can help you answer real quick? Do you understand it? Am I blabbering too much? I feel like I do that sometimes. Ah, okay. Are the are the cats and dogs a care are? Well, for the most part, you're going to see that uh, cats and dogs are very precocious. They don't need much assistance after a while. After they start moving, they do need a little bit of help. Uh, they do have lots of. Uh, Lots of babies compared to us at uh, at one time, so they're going to be kind of that in between section. And again, it's it's really annoying. My students absolutely hate it. You know, they want you know, if we're going to talk about K's and R's, there better be just K's and R's. But again, it's going to be that whole spectrum, that continuum. So again, I'm thinking with the cats and the dogs, they're going to be a little bit closer to that that K than they would the R. All right, all right. So let's uh, let's think about this real quick. When you don't fit in a model, that's again what we're talking about here with our that continuum, that spectrum right here. Many organisms are not going to fit as either a K or R, okay, because they're going to have characteristics of both. And I'm glad you asked earlier about uh, about our turtles. Oh, thank you, Katie. Uh, because turtles are relatively large creatures, they live for insane amounts of time. You know, uh, again, a certain big eared mouse movie that we referenced earlier. Uh, the fish asked the turtle, hey, how old are you? And he goes, you know, I'm 150 years young, dude. And he continues going on his happy little way. Uh, but they have lots and lots of eggs, lots of babies. They're insane. Uh, think we get trees, same thing. Absolutely massive. They live a very long time. But look at the amount of kids they, they produce. They're, it's all the time and never stopping. Okay. Uh, again, they have very long life, high, you know, they basically are competing with themselves. I know we said the, the grass isn't, but the trees have to compete with themselves. That's why you'll see that most areas underneath a tree, there's not a lot of life. They're blocking the light. They're taking up the nutrients, uh, but they're very widespread. And, you know, so again, they, they're, they're not going to be pigeonholed. They're going to be within that spectrum, that continuum. Again, our sea turtles are the same way right here. Uh, they have lots of kids, which would put them on the R side, but because of their long life and the large body size, uh, and few of them actually survive, that gets them to the K side. So again, they're going to be in between. And again, my students absolutely hate this. They want just, you know, it has to be black and white and they're tired of seeing all this gray. So let's look at the comparison. Hopefully I'll get a little chuckle out of you again. Hopefully, I did with the the generals and spe uh, specialists. If we look at the the K's and R's, K's are quite large, relatively, and R's are quite small. Again, you're, you're thinking of this as the two sides of a coin, opposite sides, of course. Parenting, the K parents will I will love you forever, and you'll stay here, and I'll take care of you. You'll always be my little baby. Where's the R's? It's like when I was about ready to go to college. My wife, my 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 mom said, "Isn't it time for you to go home? Don't you need to leave?" Okay, so it's because not that they don't love them, but they're precocious and they're able to take care of themselves. They don't need that parental guidance at all times or for a very long time. Uh, the family size, you know, how many kids you would actually have. I think of the case is just you, know, you, me, and baby makes three. You know, very small, very few in that family. And then when you look at the R's, it's like the Dogger family. Octomom is 19 kids and counting. It's just, if you were to have to send Christmas presents to them every year or uh, you know, celebrate Hanukkah with them with every year, that's going to be a lot of presents, a lot of cards, a lot of money. Okay, so we're looking at lots, a huge, absolutely massive family right here. Competition-wise, again, K's are total com uh, 
totally into that competition thing. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Whereas the R is a, little, a lot more mellow. It's like, no worries. I can just, you know, I'll just go over there. There's more sunlight over there. I'll, I'll just get that. Don't worry about it. So now in ecological session, which we didn't talk about earlier, normally you're going to see the, the K species as those, those late stage successors. Okay. When you get closer to that climax community, whereas with the R's, you're going to see these as your pioneer species, your very early stage successors, uh, your, again, your grasses and your small little shrubs and such and all the organisms that go along with them and we need that as a for a pioneer species because they've got yes uh well yeah that's the funny thing about moss moss takes a very ins miles and lichens take insanely long times to grow uh but you can find them all over the place no not really in into competition because you know i eat rocks they don't really but you get the idea so uh i think in this case, that moss and lichen, oh, again, it's going to be on that, like, it's got to be on that continuum, but I, I would put it closer due to size and widespreadedness, which is a word I just made up. Uh, it's going to be closer to the, to the R side, uh, even though it has a few characteristics of that decay. And of course, our examples, just again, if you have to just have something concrete in your mind to think about, uh, humans are definitely, as a species, we are a K species. Whereas the insects are totally ours. Okay. Thumbs up if you're good or happy face, smiley face if you're good so far. Thumbs down if you're upset because of that silly spectrum and you want everything to quit being so gray. Excellent. I'm seeing lots of happy faces, lots of thumbs up. By lots, I mean a couple. Hey, there we go. Okay. All right, let's continue. Because I don't want to take too much more time. I've only got 10 minutes left. And I do have one more thing here. Uh, so this is part of our uh, CED. There's a couple of questions in here that I wanted to pull out. And one of them is, which reproductive strategy would you basically think of as an invasive species? So would you think of them more Ks or Rs? Would you think of them more as the generalist or the specialist? Pirate Fred thinks they're going to be ours. Dakota thinks they're going to be ours as well. Yeah, so, I, yeah, they're going to be definitely closer to that R, but it's because they can, uh, they're not really worried about competition. There's They can reproduce rather rapidly because of the lack of uh, native uh, predators and all that. So, yeah, definitely think of your invasive species as being that R, okay? How about your endangered species oh yeah and your invasives are normally a generalist yeah so again we're gonna flip the coin you're gonna see that in danger most endangered species are endangered because of their uh they're basically being very narrow uh because there's too much competition and stuff like that so yeah you're gonna see those to be a k k and uh specialists okay all right so let's go on let's go talk about our third topic tonight which is survivorship curves. I love talking about this because it's so much fun. There's a beautiful lab that these little, little blue spheres represent. Okay, I'm going to move that light out of my face. I'm going to shine like a lighthouse there. All right, so we talk about survivorship curves. It's all about the number of members of your population and their various age groups. Okay. And again, we're going to be looking at a couple of curves here on a funny little graph. Uh, way easier if you use Excel or uh, Google Sheets when you graph these things. So we're looking at how many members of your population are able to survive in, spe in specific uh, age groups. Okay, And we normally have three different types of curves. Okay, Yeah, we're going to talk about life expectancy. Exactly. All right. Uh, yeah, that's that actually. Yeah, that's a very good example of his life expectancy right there. So we have three different curves. You know, your type one. I know it's a very original name. We got general specialists, R's and K's, and now we get something like type one. Science has really failed us on a super annoying uh, words here. But type one species, majority of these guys are going to actually survive to old age. 
So you're going to see not much of a curve. It's going to be rather a flat line, which I'll show you graphically here in a little bit. Uh, but the majority of their population will survive to old age. All right, so type 2. Type 2s are not really affected by their survivability or mortality. Their, the, their age groups, it does not really matter. So you'll see that a little bit better when we get to the, the visual, the graphic of this. So if type 1s last to old age and type 2s don't really matter, it's... Uh, it doesn't really matter what's happening to them. They're going to survive or die no matter what. What do you think about the type threes? Because that's our third one right here. What do you think about the life expectancy of a type three for the majority of their uh, populations? What do you think? Sorry, that noise is my Facebook notifications. Yeah. Yeah, there's not going to be a lot of, you're not going to see a whole bunch of old guys as a type 3. Definitely not. Yeah. Live hard, die young, right? So they're going to have a very high early mortality rate. The very, very few will actually live to see old age. Okay? A lot of, a lot of them are going to die off very easy. So what we do in my class is called the Survivorship Bubble Lab. Now, if you haven't done it, and I don't want to step on any teacher's toes, so I'm not going to you know, give away too much, but basically you're going to blow bubbles, which my, I use it kind of like a, uh, an advertisement for my class. Uh, you're going to blow bubbles and you find different ways to either keep them alive to old age or watch them die. Yeah, the, the kids who just sit there and watch their bubbles die are some of the sadder ones. So of course, after we're done with the lab, I'll let them, uh, experiment and bubble, uh, blow the bubbles as they walk back to the classroom. So, Let's look at uh, let's look at this. I, if you, if your teachers have not done the bubble lab with you, ask them about it. It is absolutely fun. It really truly really is. Okay, so in the bubble lab, like I said, you're gonna, you have one of three groups. You're going to keep your baby alive. You're going to stand back, or you're going to just uh, record them after they pass one meter. So that's those are the three different types. Now I didn't put them in the same order as our type one, type two, type threes, because again. I'm not getting in trouble with your teachers. So let's look at graphically what a type 1, 2, and 3 species are on this survivorship curve, okay? So look at this. All right, so again, our type 1s, again, they get to survive to old age. So as you go farther from left to right on our x-axis here, that these are like your age groups, you know, early age, you know, you know, just born, early adolescence and all that. Uh can we say Japan is a type one? Yeah, if you if you want to look at countries now, uh, later on we'll talk about no, not I, but uh, uh, we have five. We'll talk about the age pyramids, and you're going to kind of see that. Uh, yeah, you're going to see a lot of uh, life to the very end because the the Japanese can live to a, a very old age, but as a human species, we are relatively compared to some of the others able to survive for quite some time. Now, your songbirds, they're that type two. It doesn't really matter. Again, if you look back here, it doesn't really matter. Uh, their survivability and mortality, it's not age dependent at all. So you can see it's a nice little straight line, very little curve in it whatsoever. Uh, another example of this would be like squirrels. Okay. And then last but not least, we're looking at frogs. You know, they have lots of kids, not all of them get to survive. That's why you can see a huge drop off at first. And then very few will get to the end. Now, what a lot of people look at is they're saying, like, why are the humans and are there frogs the same age as humans? No, don't don't think of it. Each the the time itself is not number of years, but like uh, age categories when we're looking at. So uh, don't confuse that. Don't think that there's a frog out there that's going to be walking around in its eighties. It's just just not, especially with my dog around. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I did say this is a kind of weird, funny little graph. If you look on the side, uh, you go from 1 to 10 and then 100. That is totally bad graphing rules. You're supposed to keep a consistent scale. Except for this one is actually a logarithmic scale. And uh, I'd love to explain it to you, but I don't have the brain power to explain logarithmic. So I just know it's really easy to click a couple buttons in Excel or uh Google Sheets, but basically it gives us this beautiful little curve that we can see right here. All right, so my last chart for the evening, 
our last little fill in the board right here. Uh, if we were to fill these all in, what's the survivability at early age of these three? Oh, I've got a question right here. Uh, are turtles a type one, uh, like the Galapagos turtles? No, actually, well, uh, if we look at the amount surviving, they're going to have lots. Of, well, I have to look at specifically the Galapagos turtles again, but most of your sea turtles are going to be closer to that type three because they are going to have so many children at first, but a lot of them will not survive the first uh, actually the first couple of hours and very uh, even more won't survive the first couple of years to reach sexual maturity. Uh, we're going to see those more of that type three, you, you know, they can live quite a long time, but because of the amount of uh, children they have and the amount of early mortality, we're going to see that it doesn't work. Now, if the turtles had only a few uh, children at once, then you can see them being that type one or even closer to a type two. So the way I see it on here at early age, you have a lot of survivability at early age for all three types. Okay. Again, they're all at the very top of that graph. And then when you hit middle age, so you know the next, let's say the next third and next quarter of the our graph after that type one, still high, really high type twos, about middle and then when we reach, reach middle age for that type three it's very very low insanely low all right so what would you guys think of for the old age what would be the survivability of type one at old age say thanks yes definitely you definitely have to say thanks to your parents for old age because they are the ones that actually got you to live that long you know taught you all your good values and all that uh, when we're looking at old age for our three types, what do you think? Type one is going to be what? Is it going to be high, low, or I'm sorry, high, medium, or low survivability for old age? Uh, well, I can kind of see high, but for the most part, we're looking at it's going to be to get to be the very end of that. Let me scoot back here. If you'll look at the very end, which is you know the last quarter. We're definitely on that downhill slope, so it's, it's curved down really hardcore. So I can see it being high at the very beginning and then just dropping off. Okay. Fight Club, yeah, everyone, we don't talk about Fight Club. So our examples were from our graph right there, the humans, the songbirds, and the frogs. Now, as a care our species, what would you consider these? Because, again, we've been talking about K&R species all night long. What would you consider this? I know my time is pretty much done with y'all. So if you just be very patient, give me like two or three more minutes, I'd, I'd be so happy tonight. What would you consider our K species and our species and ours? So Fred, is that going to be, uh, is that going to be your type one, type two, type three? All right. Fred says K's are going to be your type one. Katie also has a type one K. K for a high type one. Definitely. Type three for art? Thank yes. I agree with that. What about type two? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It definitely your, your type two is definitely gonna depend. For the most part, the again, because we have that whole spectrum thing again, which is kind of annoying. Uh yeah, Dakota, I can see type two being again, it yeah, it's that category the kids hate. Uh it, it, it can kind of be both. For the most part, I see it as more of a K species because of the characteristic. I see it more on that K side than I do on the R side. That's just me personally, but you're definitely on the type one is going to be K and type three is going to be that R because of all their little, little characteristics. All right. I do appreciate y'all helping me out tonight. I love it. This was actually one of the FRTs. So if you want to go back, uh, Google it online tonight because I know my time is up and y'all have been very patient with me. Uh, if you go back and look at the uh, 2017 FRQ, I don't remember quite what question it is, but I know it's not the math question. Uh, it was actually, it might have been the math question. Hold on. Uh, it was actually talking about K and R species and was using, uh, it was talking about elephants and uh, it was asking for a characteristic of a K and R. So hopefully after tonight, you were able to give me a characteristic of a case, a case specialist or case selected and explain why and all that, why it'd be more prone to extinction. Okay. So if I see you on the street, if I see you walking around, 
or if I see you online, hopefully you'll be able to do this for me. Yeah, Dakota, you're right. It's because of their sensitivity to change. That's one of those things right there. Low reproductive rates uh, work into that sensitivity change. They are just, they just want to have everything the way they want it. They don't like a lot of change. All right. So hopefully tonight you got a little bit. I've asked, I've asked you to learn a little things about the generalist versus the special species tonight. We talk about K and R and where we came up with those silly little letters from those great guys, and then uh, talked about survivorship curves. I hope I was able to make it a little, little easier for you to uh, to think about these things. I hope you guys giggled and laughed a little bit. Uh, of course, at any time you want to follow us at think fiveable of course we're on we're on the twitter we're on the instagrams and of course we're on the youtubes and of course we're here too you know at the uh, the app.fiveable.com uh if you have any questions i'm going to be here for a few more minutes you know ask away i'll see what i can do you know uh, i hate wasting people's time i want to make sure i can do everything i can for you all right I appreciate y'all coming. And again, uh, if you give me one second, I can double check when we're supposed to have our next uh, live stream here. Let's see if it's in here yet. Do, 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 do. Yeah, so we're talking about the carrying capacity on October the 14th. It'll be about the same time. It'll be uh, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Let me go back to my window there. Here we go. So hopefully you'll join us then. It'd be great. Uh Again, I think all of our streamers around here are absolutely top-notch. All right. So if you have no more questions, do you have nothing for me? I bid you a great night. I'm going to go back to drinking the rest of my Mountain Dew and grading a whole bunch of papers for progress reports because, you know, that's what teachers do. All right. Y'all have a great night, and I hope to see you again, okay? If not me, then I hope you, uh, I hope you drop in on some of the other streams that we have going on for us. All right. So take care, y'all, and have a great night.